Hey everybody, welcome to part two of this uh, late April 2019 uh, tool hoard buy. And uh, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to start with the uh, tapping heads. All right, so when I first saw this advertisement for machinist tools and everything, the listing was over a week old. And as I was looking through the photographs, I spotted a couple of things. I saw this, couldn't really tell from the picture much about it, but I could tell what that it sure looked like a Procuniar, Procuniar uh, branded tapping head. Um, and then I saw this in the picture, and I could tell clearly that it was a Tapmatic. I couldn't see what model it was. It was a Tapmatic tapping head, and I couldn't see what it had for an arbor. We'll come to find out. We'll get to that in a moment. But anyways, um, then I saw, I think, one of these, the angle that I saw it at, I actually thought this was a um, boring head because I couldn't see this part, and you could see kind of with the adjustment and everything, the way it looks. Pictures were kind of dark. Um, I was really hoping that this was a, um, can't think of the name there. It's like a Walta, Waltoff, Popper, whatever, boring head, really pricey boring head that has a very old look to it it doesn't look like the modern criterions um but they're actually very good quality doesn't matter there was actually i think another thing that looked like a boring head in the photos but i realized that the thing was the, the listing was over a week old and that um quite frankly uh, i thought a lot of the stuff was either going to be already long gone or if it wasn't long gone it was because the prices were too high and i do think initially he might have been pricing some of this stuff higher or trying to get more money he didn't he didn't mention any prices he just said oh machinist items you know so uh he sold off a bunch of um he had some brown and sharp micrometers that looked pretty nice and stuff like that in the photos those were all gone by the time i got there but uh I actually didn't expect this Tapmatic head to still be there because the used tool store um, actually in their weekly video he had acquired a Tapmatic tapping head. I actually thought maybe he had acquired the, tap, the tapping head from this guy. So turns out maybe not. So what may be quite frankly the best buy out of all of this stuff was the first tapping head I bought was this Tapmatic 70X, okay? Um, this Tapmatic 70X, I don't know if it works, you know, um, I have no way of, uh, well, it's not true, I have a way of testing it. What I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up buying an arbor. So the interesting thing about this tapping head is there's just a hole in the back here, and... It's got a tap still in it. So the fact that it's got a tap still in it tells me that somebody was using this thing. But the funny thing is, why is there no arbor? And then I wasn't sure what the heck was supposed to drive this thing. So I actually looked up online, and it turns out, the nice thing about it is you can go into a PDF file, and this manufacturer, Tapmatic, actually shows you the different variations that were available in this head and it shows that the 70x head only came with two types of mounts one is a jt3 which is a jacobs jacobs taper 3 and the other one i forgot what the number was uh see if i could find it real quick first you're going to go into the main catalog here and we're going to look at the uh the Tapmatic series that they have, the different series, and explains the differences. And what we've got here is the, uh, the 70X. So if we go down to the page, that's for the RX. Yeah, this is the X series. Okay. This is a self reversing tapping attachments for high speed reverse and pre selective torque control. The 70X model, which is right here, is actually available with all of these different model numbers because of the different variations that are available. Also talks about the collets, rubber flex types collets that it uses, the max RPM. But here's the uh, the thing that I'm curious about right here. It says mounts S, and down here it shows 
that there are two types of, well, actually, there's six different mounts you can get for this X series. These four down here are all threaded holes. So this is not a threaded hole that we've got. So that means it's not going to be any of these. So it's got to be one of these two. Either a JT3 or a B18. Now the B18, I looked that up, and that apparently is what's known as a DIN standard. All right, so on Wikipedia, where they describe machine tapers, there's a section that talks about B tapers, and it says B series tapers are a DIN standard typically used for fitting chucks on their arbors. Um, and then it explains that a B18 equals the large end of a MT2. MT is for Morse taper. So if we look at the large end of an MT2, uh, that'll give us an idea of what dimension that should be. And then we've got uh, also up here, there's a chart for the Jacobs Taper 3. I don't know why they insist on doing this, but the Morse Taper 2, they actually show the uh, dimension in millimeters, 17.78. I can tell you right now, that's going to be a lot smaller than this. So that's about 17.79 millimeters there. You can see if that's the large end kind of lost in there okay so this should be a uh, JT3 or a Jacobs taper 3 and if I look at the chart for Jacobs taper 3 it says that the big end of the taper should be 0 0.811 or 811 thousandths or 20.599 millimeters 20.59 right there In fact, it won't quite go in, but don't forget, we're dealing with a press fit, 20.27 millimeters. Thereabouts, so I'm not quite at the very edge there. So, so I need a JT3, uh, Jacob's Taper 3 Arbor, to whatever I want, which in my case, I'm going to want a uh, R8 so that I can use this on the mill. Or more specifically, so that the next owner, because I'm probably going to sell this head, is going to uh, be able to use it on a bridge port. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest in the taper. Uh, I'm going to invest in the arbor, which uh, I can get for about 20 bucks, and put the arbor on this thing, test it, make sure it works perfectly fine, and once I'm satisfied that it works okay, I'll sell this one. So what I said before was that this was probably the deal of the day um, when I bought this stuff. Because this is the first one that I bought, and I got this tapping head, this 70x tapping head, for 20 bucks. So that's a hell of a steal on a uh, on a tapping head for 20 bucks. Oh, I don't have wrenches for it, um, but if I had the wrenches, I would take this off and show you the collet that's in there that can be changed, and it's a little rubber flex collet. It looks like a miniature uh, Jacobs collet that they use on those um, uh, those Jacobs headstocks that have rubber flex collets. So it's kind of neat. So the next one I bought was this one. Uh, and this is the Procunior. And this is what's called a EX series or EX style. And um, the, what, the way this is designed, this is actually supposed to go right on the quill of a drill press. And in through this window, you can actually see there's a disc, okay, with a couple of drive tangs on it. So what's we both agreed that obviously there was something missing here, and we looked through all the boxes, and we both agreed that more than likely when he acquired this at a surplus auction or something some years ago, that the original piece that is missing here was probably left on the machine that this was removed from. And we'll probably never see it again. I went online and was able to find photographs of a complete one with the piece. And it turns out all the piece is is a disc with um, a slot to engage those two tangs. And then the back of the disc for an arbor, all it has is a three-sided shaft. And it's a shaft with three flats on it. And the reason why it's got three flats on it is so that the three jaws of a typical drill chuck can uh, clamp onto it solidly. 
So this could be mounted on a drill press provided the quill is small enough to fit down inside this hole and also the chuck would have to be small enough. So I could, since, since there aren't any on eBay, I mean there are some of these heads and some that sold with the drive piece, but there aren't any drive pieces alone because chances are even if somebody came across that drive piece, unless they happen to own one of those heads, they probably wouldn't even know what the hell it was and it went in the trash. Scrap, you know. So I'm going to probably have to make a drive piece for this, which is, that's no big deal. Um, the question is, what can I mount this on? So the last couple of these that sold on eBay, just like this, without the drive piece, I think one brought um, 70 bucks. Now, again, I th it seems like it's okay, but I really can't tell for sure without testing it. I'm leaning towards actually keeping this one, especially if this will fit on the quill for my SIP drill press. My SIP drill press, which I haven't finished because it's been, you know, mothballed, um, might be the perfect candidate as a tapping machine with this head on it. So that's what I'm leaning towards now. Also, you know, I, I only paid 10 bucks for this head, but it's only worth probably right now I could get about 60 bucks for it on the market, you know? So maybe I should think keeping this head, since it doesn't have as much potential to make me money, sell this one, which has high potential for making me money, not worry about it. But I also have not one, but two more. Now, I'm going to jump ahead in the order here. So I bought these two tapping heads, and then near the end, when I was buying a bunch of other stuff, I brought out these two tapping heads, and we talked about them. The thing was, by the time I got to this point where I was talking about these tapping heads, I had already thrown a significant amount of cash his way, and he was starting to progressively push back with higher pricing. I think he had felt, okay, I'd been there long enough, he got a little bit of money out of me, and, you know, so we did the dance. So what ended up happening was there were a couple of items that I ended up um, passing on and didn't close the deal on. And actually, I went back the next day and um, closed the deal on no, a couple of items that I had passed on the first time, and he actually showed me a couple other things that I hadn't seen. Uh, so we'll get to that when we get to that, but... More importantly, that's why for these two heads, I actually had to pony up a little bit. I paid 50 bucks for the pair. So I'm into these two for 25 a piece. Now, they've got R8 shanks on them, so I could put this right in the machine, which is great. Um, there's supposed to be a rod that threads into here, and then you would set up some sort of a stop on your table so that when this comes around this would actually um, hit the rod, okay? So that this doesn't just keep spinning. This is going to be held fixed while this whole part spins. All right, does that make sense? This one, somebody kind of made a rod out of just a really long bolt, okay? This, I'm not sure about whether or not this is kosher or not, that this is loose like this. Uh, this is the clutch adjustment, okay? For anybody watching who doesn't know how a tapping head works, this tapping head does two things. When it's in the forward direction, all right, which is clockwise, okay, as you're feeding it down and it's going clockwise, it will drive the tap in. Through a clutch mechanism inside here, whose sensitivity can be set here, acts almost like a torque wrench, it will start to slip by design. So you set this resistance depending on the size of the tap and probably the material that you're tapping. And what happens is if that tap um, encounters a certain amount of resistance, if you've got it set correctly, this clutch will start, start slipping and it'll make a noise to indicate to you that, hey, it's, it's stuck. At that point, when you pull up on this, okay, 
retract the quill, this will automatically reverse direction. So even though it's gonna, you're still going in the same direction as far as the spindle on the machine, inside here, it will reverse direction. So what ends up happening is you end up with a situation where this will actually back the tap out. So you don't have to stop the machine and reverse it. You literally just keep the machine running. You come down, tap the hole, you hit a little resistance, back up a little bit, tap backs out, breaks the chip, goes back in again. That's the idea behind it. And that's what makes these so cool. So we've got some sort of a collet on these. Remember, yeah, this is, all right, so there we go. This, is, this also uses the little rubber collets. So they call this a rubber collet. So you get these little metal wedges in there sandwiched with rubber in between. And what happens is, we've got a cone shape here. This goes in here. When you tighten this down, which pushes that in, it causes that rubber to expand, right? And will cause those metal pieces to close down on the shank of the tap that's in there. So you need different sized collets for different sized shanks for different sized taps. But you can see it, this can handle some pretty good sized taps based on the fact that look at the size of this tap that's in there, okay? Well, it's early Sunday morning. Battery died on the camera last night. Sunday morning sneak down and uh, got my coffee and we're back at it. So we were talking about these tapping heads that I got here for 25 bucks a piece. So I cleaned this one up uh, a little bit more. Got some of the dirt and grease off of it. Still a real quick, mild cleaning, mind you. I cannot find any identification on this tapping head anywhere. Same thing with this one. So th these two right here are a mystery right now to me. So they appear to be using the, the Jacobs Flex Chucks um, um, in there. Uh, flex collets. So that might be a clue. Um, I actually was completely wrong about this right here. These are actually adjustable jaws to grab the square shank on the back of the tap. So you would use these Allen screws, I guess, to probably turn the screw and it opens and closes those jaws to clamp down on the square shank. So the tap actually gets held two ways. It uh, The round part of the shank gets held by the collet, um, but for a more positive holding force, the square part gets actually held by this. So this jaw right here um, is very reminiscent of the Tapmatic design. Note, the Tapmatic has the same type of jaw setup. So this may be an early Tapmatic, but all the pictures of early Tapmatics that I could find are clearly marked. Alright, so I just posted photographs uh, online on uh, Practical Machinist website. I posted the mystery item query about this tapping head. Uh, these tapping heads, as far as who manufactures them, I do think that they are, they're either um, early Tapmatics or they might belong to a company that Tapmatic bought out the design. And I got another mystery item that I also put on that thread, which we're going to get to in a little bit. And, uh, and it's also an item of curiosity. So the first day that I was there, because I did go back uh, a couple days later to take a second look at something I was considering buying, but we couldn't come to term on the numbers. And I'll briefly discuss that uh, at a later date. This is probably going to be a three or four part series. So I'm getting ready to close to this part two out uh, with these indicators. Uh, just mentioning that uh, there are going to be some more indicators coming up that I, I did purchase on my second trip back. A couple of them I hadn't even seen the first time because he found another box. The other one was the one I saw on the first trip, but um, we, we were five dollars apart and at that point it was late enough in the, uh, in the dealings that he was sticking to his guns and I was kind of sticking to mine, so we ended up... Uh, then the more he thought about it, the more he thought he wanted to keep that indicator. Then when he found box number two, there was an identical indicator in better shape in there without the jig attached to it, which is what I really wanted was this interesting jig. So uh, that should be up in part three. Anyways, let's get right to this. The first indicator that I purchased was the one that really intrigued me. And um, 
I had no idea on the value at the time when I bought it. Um, unfortunately, there's no case for it. It's a large face indicator. It appears to be about a three inch diameter face on this thing. And this indicator is a plus or minus indicator. It's graduated um, 0 0.00002. So this probably should clearly be on a comparator stand uh, so that this could be preloaded on whatever it is that you're measuring at the zero mark and then you could do a comparison. So that's uh, 0 0.00002. That's the hundred thousandths um, decimal place. So that's quite interesting there. This is clearly marked jeweled Hamilton Watch Company. The Hamilton Watch Company, I believe, was in Pennsylvania. Didn't even realize they made indicators. Um, I don't think I've ever owned a Hamilton before. So let's get a look at the back of this. It's got the traditional mounting back on it. It's got this large square body, which is interesting. It's got a sticker clearly marking that this is uh, the Hamilton Watch Company of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, model L-002-3. So ascertaining the value of this indicator is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, this one here is the last one that sold recently on eBay, and that was back in January 28th. This is a point zero 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 one, so this is a ten thousandths uh, resolution um, indicator. Very unusual design. It's different than the one that I've got, um, and it sold it for the best offer of sixty dollars. Okay, I paid twenty for this, so I'm safe either way, and I may very well end up keeping this. All right, so I can't find it now, but I did end up finding an ind indicator pretty much identical to this, but missing this little uh, this little hand cable here, and uh, it sold for over a hundred dollars. So I, I maybe more uh, to this mystery down the road. Maybe we'll revisit this. Let's move on. Yay! Next indicator I purchased was this Brown and Sharp Best Test. Um, this is a Swiss made best test, 0 0.0005. So this is a half thousandths indicator. Um, it's a little beat up. It's dirty as heck, but it works perfectly. And I got this for 10 bucks. So this is gonna make somebody um, who's looking for a cheap DTI happy. And with just the bare minimum effort of cleaning, clean the grime off the sides of the body, could still benefit from a new uh, a new crystal. Of course, these are plastic. Just gonna check the dovetails, make sure they're not damaged in a way that would allow uh, that would would create a problem for anybody to clamp it. But this is gonna be a this is going to be a nice little indicator for somebody. I, uh, I've got plenty of these DTIs, so matter of fact, I've, that's the next thing I got to do. That's the next herd I've got to thin is my DTI herd. And the last indicator of loose indicators that I bought that day is this, uh, this tech lock. I've had a couple of these. I actually even had a couple of these that were brand new in the box. I think these are Chinese made, if I recall correctly. I don't exactly remember. These are, these are, are an inexpensive indicator um i feared that he was going to want too much for this indicator so i didn't really give it much mind but then when he offered it to me for five bucks i took it because um at five bucks you know again gonna send it down the road look at that See, that's why i don't throw away my socks with holes in them they make nice little rags that cleaned up pretty decent and it works perfectly fine needs a point but I've got some extra points. I could probably throw a point on there for somebody. So this is sort of an indicator. Um, this is a Minotoyo thickness gauge. The original part number is a 73 something. I can't quite make it out because the sticker is damaged. But what this is, you guys have probably seen these before. It's a little handheld quick gauge for measuring thickness of items. Um, let see, probably hold it like this. And then there should be... Let's see. Let's 
All right, so that just goes underneath that screw. Then you need a very thin shank screwdriver to go in there. And then the idea is you've got a quick release to open it, okay? Put your put your material underneath there and uh, release it. Check your thickness. Now this one feels pretty sticky. Sticks a little bit at the very first release point. It's funny. It's almost it almost feels like it's magnetic. I'm sure it's not. Seems to be working perfectly fine though, as far as the indicator part goes. We got another face here that looks like it might clean up easy. That cleaned up nice. I had an Ames one of these I sold a while back. The Ames was a genuine NTQ. Um, guy who I sold that to was really happy. He actually did a, like a full restoration on it, turned it into like a pristine piece, went into his collection. It's on number 7326. It's interesting, the Minotoyo part numbers almost never run with just simple four digits like that, so I think that might indicate that this is an earlier, earlier piece, I don't know. So this, this is not a big dollar item. Um, I'm gonna tighten that screw just so it doesn't work its way loose and fall out and get lost. But this is not a very expensive uh, item. It doesn't command a lot of money. I actually ended up paying $25 for this. I think if I had uh, if I had known the typical value range on these on the used market, I probably wouldn't have even bought it at $25. But it was one of those situations where it uh, it would have been poor form for me to break out my phone and start uh, researching values you know right in front of the guy although <laughs> this last item here we're gonna have in part two which is coming up right now he actually did that and that resulted in me paying a little more for this than I wished I had so actually that items gonna be a little bit more of a discussion so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna do this as the last item for part two okay yep another surface gauge you guys can't believe it huh Stevie bought another surface gauge just got rid of a whole bunch of them right five bucks couldn't turn it down for five bucks as rusted as it is at five bucks I think this is still a really good deal and I'll tell you why for starters this screams Sterrett Sterrett makes a um, clamp identical to this. I think this is a genuine steric clamp, which leads me to believe, based on the look of this thing, that this is, in fact, a steric surface gauge that is just unmarked. It wouldn't be unusual to find a surface gauge that's completely unmarked that's made by steric. There's plenty of evidence of those out there now. The, uh, this actually still turns, which is nice. The rod is, let's see. It's gonna take a little bit of love to bring this back, but I think we've got the makings of a, of a salvageable um, Starrett surface gauge. So what I'm doing now is I'm just taking this off Sure, I see what order these parts go in. Okay, get that out of the way so I can uh, I can put the sock to work on this. All four of these locating pins are present. However, they are. Oh, I spoke too soon. I was going to say seize. That one's moving. That one moves. Betcha they use these two more often than these two. A little bit of effort, but I'm able to actually get these to move. They're not frozen completely. That's a really good sign. It's engraved right here, Tom Williams. So Tom Williams, at some point, Tom Williams is probably no longer even with us. It's got that very distinctive almost like a bluing 
finish on it that I've seen on a lot of early Starrets. That's gonna come out really well on the camera, but you see that? That finish? bottom should clean up okay. All right, so even though the bases on these sterrets are often unmarked, where they do often have markings is on this rod. We're going to have to see whether or not we can clean it up to a point where we can see something without completely destroying it. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. We got it. All right, took me a while to get this thing to focus, but you can see the LS sterret moniker right there. So this rod cleaned up pretty nice, even the ball end there. Even got this to free up now. So <clears throat> wouldn't take too much work to uh, to take this all the way to a uh, a nice restoration. The only question that remains is what particular model stare it is this stand shouldn't be too difficult to identify well that was pretty easy uh, this is definitely a stare it model 257 um, the only thing I'm not sure of is that uh, I see 257 B C's and D's there was probably a 257 a and I don't know what the difference is between them maybe it's just the size but that's this is a, a stare it 257 that I got for five bucks because it was rusted and ugly. All right, as I get ready to close out part two of this series, uh, just grab this brown and sharp micrometer, which has been sitting now for a couple of days, lightly held in my vise, um, vertical like this with this oil sitting here to see whether or not we could get anything to happen as far as getting oil to get down inside there. When I put force on this and turn it, the whole barrel here is turning, but still no action out of the uh, thimble itself, unfortunately. So I think that one is going to be a non-starter. It's going to be another one of these things where I'll probably, I would probably have to take this apart and might have very little luck getting it to break free. That's unfortunate. Oh well. So, coming up next time, we've got the item in this box that I I kind of paid a little bit too much for, but I'm probably going to end up keeping it because I don't have one. And some of the indicators that I went back and got on the second trip, um, and also the remainder of the stuff that I got on the first trip. So, um, hope you guys are enjoying these videos. If you like the videos please click the like button if you'd like to see more videos like this and other projects please subscribe take care